Okay, so uh, we are moving on to a little bit different technique for solving equations, and we keep pounding this home in lectures, but that is your bottleneck for solving your equations that you're looking at for homework two, which is this infection diffusion equations where the stream functions coupled to vorticity through this uh, Poisson equation. Okay? Now, what we've been talking about so far is say, well, I can just disc discretize this thing. Get it down to that, ax equal to b. Then it's fairly easy to solve. I can use uh, various techniques, including Gaussian elimination, which will cost me order n cubed, and LU decomposition, which will be order n squared. And so, you know, I have a technique for actually getting the solution to this. But perhaps I want to even go faster. And you do, if you can. And so, what are some other alternative techniques? As I said, people have worked a lot on this to do stuff. Grab one on the way in. Get a, get a donut. Okay. So, what I'm going to introduce today is the Fourier transform. Now, we're going to talk about the Fourier transform in the context of this problem now, and then we will develop quite a bit more of the idea of Fourier transforms uh, in another couple weeks. We're going to talk about what are spectral methods, and spectral methods is one of the things that I use all the time, a very fast, efficient methods for solving things, because what's going to happen with Fourier transform n log n. I'm going to be able to solve that problem n log n. Now, if you've ever plotted n log n, log n almost is almost constant. I mean, you take n a huge number, and this will be like 5. Try it out. Go plot log n and take n to be 1,000. This gives you a value of 8, or I don't know, something like that. It's, it's not very big. So it's almost so close to being almost growing like n. So when you look at your operation count for these three methods, you have this one here that almost grows linearly with the size of n. LU is going to do something like this, and <laughs> G Gaussian elimination is going to go way up. So if you have a large matrix, you know, you're comparing those three sort of computational times. So this is going to be a tremendously fast method for doing this. It's about as, this is as fast as you can solve this problem. Okay? Nobody's being able to beat this. You can beat that. You write a ticket to wherever you want to go in terms of an academic position. All right? All right. So just keep that in mind. Uh, so just in case you want to like set high goals for yourself. There's, there's a high goal right there. All right. So Fourier transform. Typically, the Fourier transform is defined on some interval, mathematically at least, from negative infinity to infinity. But for all practical purposes, we're actually defining things on an interval negative L to L. Okay? So we have to keep that in mind, that the, the way the Fourier transform is defined is on this infinite domain, but we'll cut it off. I guess the consequence what's going to happen is, here, boundary conditions are just imposed at infinity, and minus infinity. Here, because of the way this works, because we're on a finite domain, we're going to have to impose with Fourier transform periodic boundary conditions. Okay, and I'll show you why in a minute. All right, so let's define the Fourier transform. The Fourier transform, let's uh, so basically takes a function from physical space into what's called spectral space, or what I'm going to call it, you take a function f, its Fourier transform is defined as capital FK. And so what you essentially do is you multiply your function f by e to the i k x times dx, integrate from negative infinity to infinity, and you get out your Fourier transform variable. And now it's in k space, which is wave number space. What do I mean by wave number space? What is e to the i k x? e to the i k x, if you decompose it, k and x are both real numbers. <coughs> this is nothing more than cosine plus i sine. So what this is here is nothing more than 
oscillatory behavior. And you're integrating, you're going to take this, and this is a function of all k values. So essentially what you're saying is, let's take this function, now represent it in the space of oscill oscillations in some sense. So what I mean by wave numbers is you take something in the spatial domain, and you say, let's decompose this into its frequency components. Okay? So in other words, what makes this up is a bunch of cosines and sines. This is, in a sense, is Fourier's fundamental contribution to mathematics, which he basically uh, did, which was he said, look, I can take a function, any function, and I can represent that function as just a sum of cosines and sines. Okay? The start of the field of Fourier analysis. Very important contribution. And so now you can think about structures like this as being a collections of cosines and sines, in other words, a, as a, as a, which all have a certain frequency. And you see here, I have a continuous set of frequencies in this setup because I am integrating, and k is just a variable that can go from 0 to infinity, or negative infinity to infinity. And, by the way, the inverse Fourier transform, to get back to f of x, is defined as the following. Now you get a sign change here. You take your Fourier transform, multiply e to the minus ikx, negative sign, now integrate over all frequencies, and you get back your function. So this is called a Fourier transform pair. Some of you may have worked with trans Fourier transforms before, some of you may not. We'll develop the idea as we go here. The most important thing, though, is uh, not so much that, okay, you can, um, or let's step back a second. Who cares how this is really defined? The, the question really comes about is how do you use such a thing? In mathematics, there's different ways to solve problems, especially differential equations. One way is to, for instance, we had this idea that was developed in the first part of the course, which is take a derivative and just expand it in terms of Taylor series. So everything we've done so far is like based upon knowing how to do a Taylor series. Another way to solve a lot of problems is to transform them to a new problem. And there's a, a large variety of ways to transform problems, many of them which are useless. Okay? But the Fourier transform turns out to be this one that's incredibly powerful. Why is that? Well, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But here's the definition. You take your problem, and you're going to just apply an integral transform. You get a new problem. Now the question is, can I solve the new problem? Otherwise, why do a transform? The whole idea is that if I can transform it do it to a new problem, and if that's simple and I can solve it, let me say, okay, all I have to do now is transform it back then. Okay, so what makes this beautiful? I hate using that word with mathematics. Oh, this is beautiful. It's so elegant. You know, oh, it's beautiful mathematics. I, that's kind of corny stuff. But and so when I hear it at conferences, I'm like, oh, stop. <laughs> It's, it's cool stuff. It works out really nice. Like beautiful is a little bit of a stretch sometimes. But I guess it's all, you know, some people think of it differently than me. That's fine. They're wrong. But, okay. Anyway. So now watch what happens. The most important thing that we have to deal with is derivatives when we're solving differential equations, partial differential equations. Okay? How did we deal with derivatives before? What we did with derivatives before is we took this thing and said, well, that's a slope. Rise over run. Delta y over delta f over delta x. And by doing that, you write down this difference formula. And that's how you do a slope. And that's what allowed us to start thinking about solving things with shooting methods, or this direct solve method, or even how we want to think about solving these advection diffusion equations. So now, what I'm going to do, show you the power of the Fourier transform, is say, let's just Fourier transform the derivative. So, I'm going to represent the Fourier transform with a tent function, or put a tent over it. That means take the Fourier transform of that thing. Well, let's use our definition. So we just use what I have up on the board there. 
try and take the Fourier transform of prime. Here's the definition. Okay, so far nothing big is happening. And by the way, let's go back to here real quick. This is only one possible definition of the Fourier transform. What I mean by that is pretty much always the same. Some definitions of the Fourier transform, instead of splitting, you know, 1 over root 2 pi there, 1 over root 2 pi there, they'll just have 1 over 2 pi over here. Some of them will have either minus kx here, plus ikx here, opposite sign convention. So that really doesn't matter so much. But just to let you know, this is, not, this is one possible definition. You go to a different book, you might find another definition. You go to a third book, you might even find another possible definition. Okay? But the important is that the sign changes here, and then this is just a scaling factor. And sometimes you throw the 2 pi here, sometimes you throw it there, sometimes you split it so everybody gets square root of 2 pi. Okay? All right. So now, let's talk about evaluating this integral. Back to this. We're just going to take Fourier transform of the derivative. And I'm going to do uh, integration by parts on this. In particular, I'm going to say, let's take the derivative of that term. It's going to be my, And let's integrate this term. So your v becomes fx. Your du becomes i k e the i k x. Okay, everybody okay with that? That's whatever uh, second quarter calculus or second semester calculus. So let's put that in there. So what do you get? Well, then the integral becomes one over two pi. Okay, and then what happens now is you have u times v, which is f x e the i k x evaluated at the endpoints minus v du, which gives you negative infinity to infinity, uh, i k e z i k x f of x dx. That's what we get. Now, e z i k x is cosines and sines. As you go to infinity, it's still cosines and sines, so it's always between 1 and minus 1. One of the assumptions you want to make is that f of x, in fact, goes to 0 as in, at, at infinity. So we're going to work with functions that go to 0 at infinity and minus infinity. Well, what would happen to this integral here, then, if we go out there? x is going to go to 0. Okay? So we're taking functions that go to 0 at infinity, which means that's going to cancel that term. What you got left over, then, is the following minus i k times 1 over square root 2 pi that right there so here's a question you have this what is this term here isn't this the Fourier transform of f. That's the definition of the Fourier transform of f. So this whole thing comes out to be minus i k f hat. So there's this nice fundamental relationship which says the Fourier transform of the derivative is equal to minus i k Fourier transform of the function. Okay, that's the that's the result we get there. By the way, let's come back one second here again and say if we're working on a finite domain, negative l to l, which we are in practice, what we really need for this condition to come out is that we need First of all, this thing to be periodic on the interval. So we want to choose k values so that this thing is periodic on the interval. So at the edges, they cancel out. But also, that the function is periodic. So in fact, that's what we're going to acquire. When we start solving these things um, with Fourier transform methods, the Fourier transform method essentially is going to assume periodic boundary conditions. Here's why. We're imposing it. We're saying if they're periodic, 
this goes out to zero, I still keep all these nice relationships. It's also kind of clear why, because you're doing essentially expansion in terms of sines and cosines, which are going to be periodic on some domain negative L to L. So what you're saying is take a function, represent it, not in the wrap sense, but represent it in sines and cosines. Okay? I'm glad you all got that, because you know I'd be really sad if you didn't know what representing was. Represent baby baby. Yeah, okay. See? <laughs> Not bad. Sometimes you know I tell jokes in my other class and just sit there. I hate that. It makes me think I'm not that funny. I know I'm not that funny, but I like to think I am sometimes. All right. That's what's fundamental. Because now what we have is we have a relationship between the derivative and the Fourier transform of the function itself. We can, in fact, generalize this. Think about this. What is the Fourier transform of two derivatives? Can you guys see that, actually? Probably can't. Let me just start that over here. We're going to use this, step this up a little bit and say, OK, Fourier transform of two derivatives. Well, what do you get? Well, isn't that the Fourier transform of one derivative of f prime? So what do we know about the Fourier transform of one derivative of a function? Well, I have this result over here, which just says, oh, I get minus i k times, I'm just using that previous result. Take this function here, the derivative of it, take the Fourier transform, I get back minus i k times the Fourier transform of that function. Well, what is that, though? Fourier transform of the derivative, well, then I can use what I had before. So this then gives me, in fact, uh, minus k squared time. In fact, I can do this for any order of derivative, and I get the following. Fourier transform of the nth derivative just gives me i k to the nth power f. That is the magic. Of the, I mean, this this here, this is what makes the Fourier transform one of the most important methods that have been developed for solving computational problems, right there. So within the infinity of transformations you could think about applying to something, you can make any transformation up you want. Most of it's going to be garbage. The reason is because you take a problem, you transform it, you get something you can't solve. So the transform is kind of stupid. Here power of this is that you have the special property specifically associated with this definition of, for each, of, of transform. And because of that, this thing here is going to allow us to just put the smack down on problems. Okay? Because now it gives us this relationship between derivatives and higher things. You know what smack down is, don't you, Pierre? Kind of figured it out, I don't know. You don't know? Have you seen Big Time Wrestling? They don't have that in France? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> Too bad. I mean, see, they're not getting all the good culture we have here. This is uh, our finest and best culture. We can, yeah, we try to keep it in house though. We don't want anybody catching on and getting ideas that they can. You know. Yeah. Okay. So sneak an episode sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure you'll appreciate it. Okay. So how does this come to play out? Let's do a problem. Let's do the following problem. Y double prime minus omega squared y is equal to minus f of x. Second order differential equation, and we just want to solve it. Now it's on an infinite domain. And you have some different methods for solving this that you could also solve it besides the Fourier transform. But what we're going to do is talk about how do you solve this with a Fourier transform. Well, transform it. What do you get? Transform the whole equation, you get y double prime transform minus omega squared y prime. And by the way, when I take the transform of this, this is just a constant. So I can just take it out of the integral. So I just get back this is equal to minus f transform. What do I know about the second derivative? Second derivative is minus k squared transform of y. And now watch what happens here. 
Now, everybody's in terms of y prime. That's the thing I'm trying to solve for. I'm trying to solve for y. I now can easily, I just have a set of algebra equations now to solve for y prime. So for y prime, if I want to solve for that, I get, or solve it y, y hat, I get the following. A little bit of algebra. That's all I've got to do. So you see what it does is it takes a problem, which is a differential equation, turns it into nothing more than algebra. At this point, I can solve for y hat, which is just this quantity here. Once I get it, just inverse, inverse the transform. Invert the transform, right? So now I can just go back and by re inverse doing the transform, I just get y back. There's my solution. Okay. The trick for solving differential equations always, always, always is the following. Take the equation, turn it into algebra. It's never any more difficult than that. But actually, that's the only way you know how to solve these problems, is if you can take a differential equation or a partial differential equation and turn it into a set of algebra. Understand this. You never know. You, you'll never learn how to do anything more than solve algebra in your life in many ways. All you're really learning is fancy techniques to turn these problems that look harder than algebra and turn them into algebra. Okay? Underlying the philosophy of all that is, is as simple as that, because that's all you really know how to do is algebra. And every method is meant to reduce the problem down to algebra, solve that algebra, undo the steps you did, you got your solution to something that looks harder than algebra, but never really was in the end. Okay? This is why nonlinear problems are so hard. Nonlinear problems are so hard because we don't know how to do the algebra <laughs> with nonlinear problems. And there's not a lot of techniques that allow us to do the algebra for nonlinear problems very easily. Okay. So that's it. That's the fundamental idea. And you can see, simple example, reduce the algebra, get your solution, go back out. Okay. So, some comments then about this method. When you do this method, you obviously have to pay a price. You can do this computationally very easily. You just take this thing, you Fourier transform it. Like for instance, you want to calculate the Fourier transform of y or f. So for, for instance, if you need to calculate the Fourier transform of f, you would just use the command FFTF. It's as simple as that in that one and uses what's called a fast Fourier transform routine to do it. You want to undo this here to get y? You just say i FFT this y hat, which is the inverse Fourier transform. Yeah? Where did the fast Fourier transform routine, where did it come from? Where did that work? We're going to talk a lot more about that as we come along. But I'll, I'll make some, I'm going to make some comments about it right now. So this is all you have to do in MATLAB to do this. Now the question is, why is this an important method? Not only is it kind of not nice here in terms of actually um, turning your problem into algebra, but the cost of doing this and long n. That's the point. So to solve this problem, I can reduce it down to n log n because I can make this transform happen that quickly. Okay. We're actually going to go into the guts of the fast Fourier transform. I have a whole lecture on that. We will discuss that in detail later on. But let me make some more, it's just over, uh, you know, some just general comments, I guess, about, about this at this point. So, fast Fourier transform. So obviously, if you want to use this technique from a computational point of view, you've got to figure out a way to take these transforms. Uh, and people were doing this for quite a while time. I mean, the computer was invented sort of in the 40s and 50s, started coming into fruition. And somewhere around the mid-60s, as they were listening to their Jimi Hendrix really loud with tie-dye shirts on. You know all about that, right, Pierre? OK, excellent. OK. These two guys, Cooley and Tukey, 
basically he came up with this algorithm called the FFT, Fast Fourier <coughs> Transform. Top 10 algorithms of the last century. One of them. Okay? And essentially what this allowed them to do is to solve this problem, in other words, calculate this Fourier transform in n log n time. Making them complete studs. Okay? So, uh, it's pretty cool. I think they were actually working in IBM I, or something like this. They're working some company. What they needed to do, they were trying to solve this as quickly as possible. Right? Back then, their computers were slow. Right? You take the mid 60s, think about the computer they had on their desk, if they had one, or if it took up a whole room. Uh, I mean, it, it's amazing right, uh, how slow this was. I mean, you could take. Um, I don't know, you could take any of your, your cell phones and the computational power in your cell phone chip is probably, you know, 100 times what this was. So if you're trying to do a computation, this is what you had to work with. So you need, speed was even more critical then than it is now. Now we have the luxury of, oh, this code's not that big. I don't care if I'm doing the most inefficient way, press return. So I have to wait five seconds instead of three. Big deal. That's how our computational power has grown for a lot of computations. But back then, this is not the case. Okay, is this a day, two days, or is this uh, 10 days? Okay, so very important. So here's, what they, uh, here's some of the important features of this thing. One, operation count. And actually, this is probably the most important feature. If it weren't for this fact, people still might use Fourier transforms, but you can just use all the other methods just as easily. There's no reason why this would be advantageous. So if you're doing all these uh, discretizations, eh, why should I switch over to something that doesn't get me anything faster? But because of that, all of a sudden you've got a method where if you can use it, you will. You try hard to set up your problem so that this is something you can use. Okay, because this is as fast as people have been able to do, and log in. Two. The transform, from a theoretical point of view, is defined on the interval negative infinity infinity. But we have to define it on negative l to l. And remember that we have this e to the i k x here. That's the transform kernel, right? We multiply the function by this and then integrate. This is nothing more than oscillatory, and what this implies here is that you have to have periodic boundary conditions. Okay, so it's another important feature. Now again, you may ask, doesn't that seem kind of restrictive? It can be. For some problems, this just is not going to do the trick for you. But for instance, the kind of things we're looking at, this advection, diffusion, vorticity in the atmosphere, you can think about it. Suppose I'm looking at some vorticity floating around in my grid. Well, maybe out of my boundaries, there's no vorticity out there. So essentially, it's periodic boundary conditions, but my solution is pretty much zero, or 10 to the minus, let's say, 6. Well, who cares if 10 to the minus 6 is talking to the 10 to the minus 6 over here? That's not a big deal. You're not making that much error in doing uh, periodic, uh, periodic uh, boundary conditions. So as long as all the critical behavior is happening well away from the boundaries, then this doesn't matter. And that's often the case for a lot of examples that we want to consider. Okay. Um, the key to getting this low operation count is a factorization process. They take a problem of size n and they break it up this is, this is their algorithm. This is what they came up with. This is the thing that revolutionized the use of the Fourier transform. They created an algorithm that said that was basically based on the fact that you had this sitting there. And they were able to say, take a problem with n points, n values that you have, you know, it's an array of n points, and break it up into two problems, each of size n over 2. Take the problem of n over 2, break it up into two problems of size n over 4. Take each one of those size n over 8. 
So you take your whole problem, you keep breaking it down and factoring it out, and what you end up solving then is a bunch of one by ones, n one by one problems versus an n by n problem. And in order to do the factorization all the way down like that, you have to have uh, 2 to the n points. So if you break up your domain, the total number of points will be 2 to the n, where n is something you determine. So you can have 2 points, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, so forth. Now, with that said, let me back off that statement slightly. A lot of people have worked very hard since this, this, when this originally was developed in the 60s, and you know, in the decade or two past that, people always use these two end points. But now, people have worked very hard to say, just give me a number of points you want. 100? I know it's not to the end, but I will basically set up the routine to take care of the problem. And it still can kind of, pretty much now, you can, don't even have to give it to the end points, and it will still do your computation at n log n. So they've worked hard at basically, instead of making it fit this, they say, okay, you've got 100 points, I'll find a way to basically factor it out nicely for you so that basically you're still doing n log n. And the final thing, which is actually another big win, is it has what's called spectral, spectral accuracy. Okay, this is important. When we did the finite difference routines, we said, hey, why don't you use the central difference schemes that's ordered delta t squared accurate, or delta t fourth, second order accurate, fourth order accurate, things like this. Spectral methods have what's called infinite order accuracy. So from the viewpoint of the Taylor expansions, this is much, much better. They still may, they're still not completely accurate, but they have accuracy properties that are, are, are just far exceed any of your discretization that you would do with Taylor expansions. Okay, So this is a huge win, that's a huge win. Those are the two things that make this uh, such a, a vital uh, piece to doing things. Okay, I was going to make one more comment about accuracy. I don't even remember what I was going to say. <laughs> I know it was important. Um, I'll come back to it if I think. In fact, why don't you guys take a little break, get up there, get a donut, sit back down if you want, and then we'll continue. I'm going to just erase the board. And you guys can, no? Nobody's going to take another donut? Come on. No? Come on. Don't be shy. I'm not looking. You can even sneak. Well, there you go. All right. I brought a lot. There's still a lot in there. So go to town. Yeah. You can finish it off for me? In fact, let's just do this on TV. Let's see if you can take the sixth donut down all in one. You guys still need the time. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, you got to hold it up. You just need to see what people are missing. All right, here's the deal now. With this established, let's come back to what we want to solve for this problem. Okay? Which is, uh, we want to solve this. So let's think about how to go about that, solving that with fast forward, with FFTs. Well, this here is nothing more than. Uh, Two derivatives in x, two derivatives in y, is equal to omega. So hat or tent will represent the x transform, <coughs> and tilde will represent the y transform. Okay, that's what we're going to do. So we're going to have a Fourier transform in x and a Fourier transform in y. So there's two spatial variables now. Okay, so let's take the Fourier transform of this whole equation in x. Yeah. We don't consider on the z axis. No. It's, it's not. It's just two. Yeah, just two dimensional. Two -dimensional. Yeah. So then, if you Fourier transform this thing, you had it and you had it and you had it in x now. 
What does this become? Well, that's just two derivatives. So kx squared, remember, this is going to be kx, so it's the wave number in the k direction versus the wave number in the y direction. And you get this plus, and then this becomes just y derivative of phi hat is equal to. So if you take the y derivative, just come, come out of the, the integral. You can change integral and differentiation because one's with respect to y, one's with respect to x. They don't, they're not affecting each other. Now, take the whole transform of the whole equation now with respect to y. Tilde, tilde, tilde. Oh, sorry. This tilde has to go like that now. Well, this is, stays what it is because that's just a constant now. This now, taking the Fourier transform in y, or two derivatives in y, that's going to pop out of minus ky squared. So I can solve for my stream function. My stream function is that's it. Again, it turned it into algebra. All right? And, by the way, what do I need to do then to solve this problem? All I need to do is calculate the vorticity. It's Fourier transform in x and y. So I really need a two-dimensional Fourier transform. That's easy. FFT2 for two-dimensional Fourier transform. Omega. That's it. Piece of cake. How's it doing? Good. <laughs> <laughs> so you take the Fourier transform, you divide by this, and then you inverse Fourier transform this. How do you inverse Fourier transform this? You just say I F F T two. The stuff. Done. Simple as that. You want a three dimensional Fourier transform? F F T three. And in fact, MATLAB allows you to do n dimensional Fourier transforms. MATLAB also has built in what's called FFTW. That is the fastest Fourier transform routine that's been developed to date. Okay? So, and that was actually fairly recent. The last two years, they now have FFTW as their standard fast Fourier transform solver. So, for instance, if you go to an old numerical recipes book, there is a fast Fourier transform routine in there. It's not the fastest one. FFTW is. They just tie it into this. Okay? But that's the idea of what you want to do. It's as simple as that. The only thing you have to actually keep aware of is that k of x and k of y in the MATLAB thinking, k of x and k of y now are big matrices. Right? This is a two-dimensional problem. So I have kx. So I have to think about that's a big matrix, matrix, matrix. Remember, when I do this operation, all dimensions have to agree. I'm doing it component by component. So what you've got to figure out how to do is construct this thing here as a big matrix, that as a big matrix, and then MATLAB, you're going to put a dot there, and then do this. Okay. Good. So you will find, when you do the coding, you're going to compare a lot of different techniques. This is going to be your fastest one by far when you solve your code. So at the end, I say compare all these different methods, choose your favorite method, and I tell you to do a bunch of other things with it. Your favorite method should be this, because this is going to be a lot faster. You may have another favorite method. Maybe you like to wait around the computer a bit, not surf some more, because it's going too fast. Well, the idea is this is supposed to be the best one. Yeah? So the KEX and KYZ matrices, um, the last line is not a dividing, is a inverse of a matrix, no? This here? Yeah, well, it's, it's one by components. That's why the dot's there. So in MATLAB, yeah, there's gonna in MATLAB you're gonna have a dot because you're gonna have to do this component by component. That operation. Okay, for each component of a W and each component of a Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because remember this is this is now W is a bunch of points all over yeah. here. So for each point you have to say what's my KX and KY there, divide by it. Now we come to the technical issues that are a little bit difficult. One. What happens if kx and ky are both zero? Which they will be. Well, you divide by zero. 
that's a problem. Your computer will stop right there and say, divide by zero problem, take care of it. Okay? So, that's one issue that we have to take care of. So we have, for the FFT method, to this problem, we have to take care of the divide by zero. How do you take care of that? Well, the way you take care of it, you say, where, when k of x, there is some value of k of x, this is, remember, going to be some matrix or vector. Whenever this thing is 0, well, why don't you just make it like, I don't know, 10 to minus 6 or something like that. It's pretty much 0. And in fact, you're squaring it, so 10 to minus 6 is like 10 to minus 12. It's like making numerical round off error. But as far as the computer is concerned, it's like, I'm not dividing by 0. Your error in doing this is only like 10 to the minus 12. Same thing with ky. You find out the component that's 0, and you say, I'm going to replace it by that. Okay, Standard trick. This is what kind of makes the coding and, and programming interesting as, you f as you're finding with homework one, I hope, is that there's a lot of little massaging of things you've got to do to make it work. And a lot of things you've got to figure out to make it work. It's not sort of like black box, Let's take this, do it, boom, it always works. It's like, oh yeah, I've got to do this and this, and oh yeah, now, and then you get it to work out. That's one issue to take care of, though. If you're Let me um, just... Uh, avoid the point that where we, uh, you know, just like uh, not considering and then approximate between points around it after afterwards. Well, what happens is when you Fourier transform, it takes it says the kx equals zero component. Yeah. Remember, you're basically expanding in things like this. So when k of x is zero, that means cosine zero. That means one. You're saying if I you can't avoid that one. That's one of your most important. Fourier components used in the problem. Does that make sense? No. No. Okay, we'll, let's talk about this more later because okay. it gets back to Fourier, Fourier uh, analysis that we can come back to. Uh, but yeah, the k, the k zero and k y, k x zero, k y zero are very important modes that you can't get around. Second most important point. And this will be very important. So if you're at home with the guys in the camera, you better listen. This last part piece is, is key. You're solving, did my hand gestures look menacing enough or very important enough? <laughs> Listen, very important. We're solving this, right? Now, I'm going to ask the following question. Suppose I have a solution to this. Sign on. So that's my solution. What if I add a constant? Is that now a solution? Throw it in there. It's two derivatives in x, two derivatives in y. Oh, it just goes right through that. And remember, what is a string function? The derivative of the string function x and the derivative of the string function y gives us our components of velocity in the u and v direct or in the x and y direction. So all we care about, really, for this is the derivative. So if I add this constant, it doesn't make a bit of difference. Everybody agree with that? But we're trying to solve this problem. And let's go back to when we discretize. We already wrote down the matrix A that does this for us. Now, what we just said is, in fact, if I can add a constant C for it, how many solutions do I have for this? infinite number. For every C, that's a solution. Now, when I do this, how many solutions do I expect if I expect this to work? If I do Gaussian eliminations, expect one unique solution. How many are there? Infinity. So, what's the determinant of A? I know I'm kind of connecting a lot of things right now. If the determinant of A is 0, that means there is either no solution or an infinite number of solutions. And what you know from here is that there is an infinite number. That means when you go to solve this, your computer is going to actually go, 
whoa, I can't solve it. Can't determine solution. Determinant is zero. So, and the reason why is because it's a physical reason why. There's that C. There's this indeterminacy. How to get around that? Do you remember what this matrix looks like? Negative four on the diagonals, all the way down. All I need to do is make it so the determinant isn't zero. So in fact, why don't I just do this? A11 is zero. It used to be negative four, now it's zero. Now if I take the determinant, it's not zero. Isn't that kind of arbitrary? Absolutely. Do I care? Absolutely not. All this does is it picks a certain constant C out. A constant C that I don't really care about at all. I could change this to 10 instead. I could pick anything except for negative 4. If I pick negative 4, the determinant matrix is 0. If I pick anything besides negative 4, it's not 0. And that means I get one and only one solution, and it basically arbitrarily picks out a constant C to be here. So when you go to solve this problem, after you define the matrix A, you've got to go and change. I just said change the first diagonal point from negative 4. You could change any number in there if you want. Go find a number. Where's the 0? And change it. I just picked one that's very convenient to change. It just doesn't matter what I change it to at all. As long as the matrix isn't 0. This is a standard technique also. Some people change one row of the equation, the term isn't zero, then you can just go ahead and solve it. You get one unique solution. That unique solution has a very specific corresponding C, a unique C. But in the end, I don't care because the only thing I care about for the stream function is that the stream function get me back my vorticity. And remember, in the vorticity equation, the vorticity equation only depends upon psi of x and psi of y, the derivatives of psi. The constant does not play a role anywhere in the problem. You just have to make sure this determinant isn't zero. Okay. That's a very important point, right? Everybody, important point? Okay. All right, I think that's it for today. You guys have a nice, is it Wednesday today? It is Wednesday today. Let's finish these up on the way out. And uh, 